mic on tonight. Uh, I didn't realize it fell off until Les telling me a little while ago he went. So, so I'll try to keep it on tonight as much as I can. <laughs> Good to see everybody out this evening with all the sickness and everything that is going on within this valley. So uh, let's keep them within our prayers. I want to talk about football tonight. I know a lot of us probably think we know a good bit about football, and, and we watch a lot of TV probably this afternoon, watching certain teams and hoping some will lose, some will win, and, and so our team maybe have the opportunity to make the playoffs and all of this. And actually, we're going to take what we can learn from football and apply it to the church. And you're going to say, well, How's, how's that? Well, let's find out. We need to understand that, that there is so much that uh, we can learn from, from this. In 1 Corinthians, the ninth chapter, verses 24 and 25, Paul realized that an athlete is involved, and uh, he used them for an example. He says, Know ye not that which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize, so run that you may obtain. And every man that striveth for mastery is temperate in all things, now that they do it to obtain a, a corruptible crown. But we are incorruptible. The thing is, when you talk about Affleck, they, they work out all the time. I know uh, growing up uh, over in Carmichael's, they, teams didn't see a football until 1st of August. They never worked out. Then when I moved over here and heard about Brook High School, and I first drove by it, I thought it was a small college. That's how big it was uh, compared to the school I attended. And I asked Maria, I said, this is college? She said, no, that's Brook High School. Said, how many students? Yeah. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I hear about how these football players are constantly working out uh, during the summer, trying to get in shape for football. And we never heard such over home. But I found out years later, probably about uh, 15, 20 years ago, they started. And they started imitating teams like Brooke and started lifting weights and trying to make themselves prepared and, and run up and down hills and, and get in shape so that when football season, they're ready to go. And we have a lot of individuals that put a lot of effort in trying to, to be great within uh, the sports. And actually, we're running. We're striving for a prize that has been offered to us, which is heaven our home. And we are running that race upon this earth, trying to get there. And we all have that opportunity to receive that prize. It's incorruptible. And we should have a greater interest in what we do sometimes and, and trying to do what we know to be doing. But at the same time, sports can occupy too much of our time in our life. If you turn over to 2 Timothy, the third chapter, and verses begin with verse 1. This know also that in the last day perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. For of this sort they are crept into houses and lead cap captive silly women laden with sin, led away with diver lust, ever learning they were able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janus and Jane Bruce withstood Moses, so did they also resist, resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith, that they should proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifested to all men, as theirs also was. 
there are men that were, and, and you see this uh, in our everyday lot, that men brag about themselves, and they, they're heady, they're high-minded. We had one, I guess, on TV today that uh, walked off a football field because he was upset about something. I, I don't know what it was. But he took his jersey off, threw it down, walked off the, out, out, out in the middle of a game. What kind of individual does that? Unless they're heady, high-minded, they're proud, they're boasters, they're covetous. All these things that we've talked about here. And the thing is, they are lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. And there are individuals that will work out to the point where they uh, will tie themselves up in, in trying to get uh, muscular and, and things on this order to, to be a superstar within sports. I see an advertisement for uh, LeBron James once in a while, and he, I mean, the guy is, is muscular. I mean, I mean, he had to work out a good bit to, to be like that. But what profit is it? Well, he, he may make his millions now, but what profit is it down the road? Did you ever think about that? Is it going to get them to heaven? Is it going to help them and, and, God, and, and walk up to God at the judgment day and say, look, look at all the times I spent trying to work out so that I can be a fit individual. You need to let me into heaven. You think God's going to accept that? I don't think so. And when there's these, these are things that we as Christians need to worry about. Now, let's go into football. They have a plan. These teams, when they get together and work out throughout the week, they know what team they're coming up with, and they try to, to find the weak spots of the other team. And they execute a plan trying to figure out how they can get around them. Sometimes if, if it's a, a field goal uh, kicker and there's a, there's a spot that they think they can sneak through to block the, the kick, they'll try. They plan these things. It just don't all happen. They just don't all go out there and, and just run around. Uh, I think some teams do <laughs> the way they act. But th there's a plan. And they tell the quarterback, well, what plays we want to run at a certain time. And they figure and, and work on this on a constant basis. The thing is, we need to understand that we have a plan as a church. The first one is, the work of the church is to serve the Lord. In Romans, the 12th chapter, verses 1 through 11, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable perfect will of God. For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one in Christ and every one members one of another. Having then gifts differently according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Or ministry, let us wait on our ministering. Or he that teacheth on teaching. Or he that exhorteth or exhortation. He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence. He that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly and affectionate one to another in brotherly love. And honor preferring one another. Not slothful in business, 
fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. All these things that we listed in these verses are all in taking part and executing a plan God has set up. Do we all have the same talents? Do all the football players have the same talents? You got one as a quarterback. You got a couple maybe a running back. You got a couple wide receivers. They all have certain responsibilities. They all have a certain job that they are to carry out. And trying to execute the plan. You got an uh, offensive line. You got a defensive line. You got those who are safety and linebackers. They all have to be in a certain spot at a certain time. We likewise, as Christians, within the Lord's church, all have a responsibility. We all have the opportunity to do something that will benefit the team or God's uh, church, as you would think of it. Not everyone follows the same word. you got to have unity. Now, if these players ain't not united and, and playing on the same mind, and uh, as the quarterback sneaks up behind the center and calls out uh, some uh, plays, if they're not all the same mind, say, well, one over here uh, says, well, I'm going to take off sooner than he, because I know he's about ready to say hike. What happens? They get penalized, don't they? Same way with us. Same way if we act up in the church. First Timothy, the third chapter, verse 15. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou ought oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. The fact that we need to learn that we are to do things the way God has set up. That's it. Just like a coach tells his team how to do things, when to do it, execute it, God has set the same thing up for us. Paul wrote in Romans, uh, the first chapter, and beginning at verse 14, I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and unwise. So as, as much as in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are in Rome also. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation, everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. As I say, the coach, the one executing the team, execute the plan. They spread it to the other players what they need to be doing. You have those who are, are, are rookies, they're learning off the older ones how they're supposed to play, how they're supposed to behave, how to act when they're out among individuals, how they're to act among the team, how they're supposed to work together as a unit. We as Christians need to learn the same thing. There is a responsibility given to us uh, by those who are trying to preach and teach God's Word, those who are elders within a congregation, those who are deacons, trying to get the congregation to work together and work as a unit. When you got a football team that does work together, you're going to have a good team. You're going to have a great team, depending on how much they work together. But if you got somebody that keeps messing up all the time, you're going to have problems. I don't know how many times I've seen team members walk over to another one and, and, and start screaming in their face because they're not doing their responsibility. They're not dedicated and, and got their mind focused on what they were doing. I think basketball game last year uh, as Mountaineers were playing Texas. They got to the point where uh, one said the other player wasn't playing hard enough. He went over there and almost got in a fist fight with his own team member. The team fell apart after that in that game because there was strife. They were fighting among themselves. One was trying to, to say that he was much better than the other individual, 
And you, you, you stir up this cord within the body of Christ when you do that. And that's something that we need to, to work on and make sure that we as, as members are trying to execute the plan that God has given to us. And we need to apply that. When everybody follows the same word, unity can be achieved. John, the 17th chapter, verses 20 through 21, where Christ is praying to his Father, stating that he wanted everybody to be united, to believe in one thing. In verse 20, he says, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which believe on me through their word, that they may all be one as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one of us in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Now, if you've got a congregation fighting among themselves, what's the attitude that's going to be out in the world? They claim to be Christians, claim to love one another. They can't even, they can't even stand each other. So why should I go there? They don't believe in what they teach. They don't carry out what, God has commanded them to do. Why should I attend and be among that group? See? We need to be careful what we do, how we act. We need to make sure that, that as on a team, and I kind of dread these uh, teams where now in college where you transport from one team to another, there's no way to get consistent. There's no way to get the team to work together when you got people moving here and there. And, and, and because they don't like somebody, they, they want to be traded or they, they, they dedicate themselves to another team. There's no unity. And Christ pleaded with God, his Father, that we be with us, that they be united in, in trying to do his will. And that's something we need to be striving for. Also in 1 Corinthians, the second chapter, in verses 4 and 5, Paul wrote, he says, In my speech, my preaching, was not with enticing words of men's wisdom, but a demonstration of the power of, of, of spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Remember, old basketball coach I had at Carmichael's, and back then, uh, if you didn't do the right thing in the basketball court, he went up behind you, take his foot, and kick you in the, in the behind. And then he'd stand there and chew you up. And nowadays, you got people that are so touchy that you almost have to beg them, plead with them. Oh, now, Come on, you, you, you made this little mistake, and, and uh, you know, can't you try a little bit better? I mean, in the, in the military, uh, you join in. If you was heavy set, they worked the weight off you. You didn't get out. They worked it off. My uncle went in, 120 pounds, like I was when I was in high school. They put the weight on. They wanted them to be lean, mean, uh, fighting machine. And they fed them until they put the weight on and worked them out. And sometimes we got to the point where we need to be straight forward with teaching God's Word. Paul said he didn't teach with enticing words but man's wisdom. But he did things in the power that God has given to him at that time. And we need to, to be the same way. And don't think these coaches don't walk up and grab them by the face mask once in a while to try to get a point across to them. Because it's important. It's meaningful to them. It's their job. Okay. So now, we understand that we are executing a plan. Now, each person has his job to do. Let's talk about that. 
How many times have you heard a coach discussing a breakdown in play as being the result of a player not doing their job? If you ever hear after the game, well, uh, yeah, uh, we had a couple guys that the penalty, they, they know better than to do that. They should never have done what they did, and it cost us a play, cost us our team, and we lost the game because of it. I think a few weeks ago, uh, watch a Mountaineer football game, and the quarterback was standing back there doing a shotgun, and the center uh, hiked it before time for the quarterback to get the ball because he didn't call for it. And the quarterback went, and there goes the football. <laughs> Pass him, and he loses 15 yards because he's chasing after the ball so the other team can't get it. Then the very next play, illegal motion from the same guy. And it actually ended up costing the team the win. Because they're driving down the field, they're ready, they ready to score. But because he didn't concentrate on what he was doing, or supposed to have been doing, he cost the team. And sometimes that happens within the church. Sometimes we have those that, that just don't really dedicate themselves as they should in trying to do what God wants us to do. As read in 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, verses 12 through 27, a little while ago, each one of us are a member. Our body has members. We have fingers, we have toes, we have arms, we have legs. Each one has a responsibility. Our ears, our, our, our eyesight, if they're not working properly, you're going to have difficulties. And believe me, after learning how bad my eyes were, I mean, didn't realize how bad they were until the cataracts were removed. I went to Pittsburgh. I couldn't read the sign until I'm almost underneath it. And for me to try to find my place, way around, that's dangerous. Because now i got to realize i got to get out of this lane real quick and get over somewhere else. And you're up there in traffic, you ain't doing it. It's not going to happen. Then you get in a section of town, you get lost, <laughs> and then you try to find your way back out. And that happened one night. When Marie was in Allegheny, we came across the West Side Bridge that had a route detour. Now, the only detour signs up was at the beginning, and that was it. Me and Jim drove around for two hours trying to find our way back to Robertson Township. We were lost. Matter of fact, we, we couldn't hardly find a gas station. When we finally did about an hour and a half later, we pulled in and <laughs> asked for help. But we were lost. It wasn't working properly. And that's the same way if our bodies, if it's not working properly, we have difficulties. And when you have a congregation that's not working together as the body works, you're going to have difficulties. You're going to have problems. And as in verse 26 says, and whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. And one member may be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ and members in particular. You ever see them teams when they score a touchdown? What happens? They all get there and, and, and pat the guy on the back and lift him up. And, and I think sometimes they're, they're trying to drop him. <laughs> so, but the thing is, they're happy. And they're tickled to death. And the quarterback will come up and, and high-five the, the, the uh, offensive line because they had protected him long enough to get the ball to the right individual. They're tickled to death. And that's the way we ought to be as members in the body of Christ. When something goes good to, with another individual, we need to be happy for them. We need to, to, to hold them up. 
and glory with them. But when their sadness comes in, then likewise, we, we share that sadness with that individual. But do we? And that's something that football teams have, have struggled and, and tried to do uh, with at that time. Uh, they, they are a unit. But if they don't play together, you got a bad team. You got a team that, that can't do what they're supposed to be doing at that time. You always wonder why some teams get beat uh, by 20 or 30 points because they're not working together most of the time. Also, the fact that in Ephesians, the fourth chapter, verse 15, it says, But speaking the truth in love, may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, for whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, make up increase of the body to the edify itself in love. Congregation is going to grow if they care and love for one another, if they're trying to do God's will to the best of their ability. What about the church in the first century? How many were baptized on the day of Pentecost? Then you go over to the next chapter. How many were baptized at that time? Why? Why did the church grow in that area at that time? How did the church grow fighting against the Roman government that was putting Christians to death? Because they worked together. They showed love for one another. If somebody needed something, they were there. Why do some congregations grow and others don't? Because they work together. They love one another. They show affection towards one another as should be in accordance to God's word. What happens to those who don't? Because their strife, their division. You usually have an individual that is heady and high-minded and wants things his way where there's no way at all. You have that on a football team. You've got a team that is going to be completely destroyed. They won't get anything done. Now, again, how are we? All Christians have a job. Some of us may be speakers. Some of us might be teachers. Some of us may know how to, to care for an individual that is sick. Maybe we can go visiting. Maybe we can do personal work when somebody else don't have the, the ability. We train. We teach. We work together. And that's what we do as a church, the body of Christ. Tell you what, you hit your thumb with a hammer hard enough, but it all hurts. <laughs> Not just that thumb. <laughs> Believe me. Or you hurt your leg, and then the next thing you know, you, you're trying to, to cover up for that uh, aching leg, and, and then your hips start hurting, and maybe it bothers your back, and, and it, all, it all affects one another. You have a headache. You have a migraine. What all does it affect? Not just the mind, not just your head. It affects the rest of your body likewise. So let's be careful. We all have a responsibility, and we need to carry out that responsibility. And finally, God says to give it our all. 100%. Actually, 110%. Give your extra. Do all that you can within the church, within the body of Christ. 
Ecclesiastes, the ninth chapter, and verse 10. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with all thy might. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom within the grave, whether thou goest. Put all you have into it. We need to be striving for, for everything we can to do God's will. Those of us that work in a mill or, or wherever, I wonder, what kind of workers did you come up with? Work beside. You may find one or two individuals that may put all their effort in trying to get something done. They won't quit. They want to have it done as soon as possible. They'll keep striving as hard as they can. They put everything they can into it. Then you have other ones that just lollygags around and, and really don't, boss, boss ain't sitting around. Uh, I don't have to work so hard. And then the boss comes around and you see him putting everything into it and, and trying to, to impress the boss. And the boss gets the well, Boy, he's a good hard worker. As soon as he walks away again, uh, I'm, I'm going to sit over here for a minute. <laughs> you, you do what you need to do plus my job too. They don't say it that way, but it carries out that way a lot of times. How much effort do you put in your work? God said we need to put everything that we do, we put it, everything into it. In Colossians, the third chapter, in verse 23 and 24, it says, Whatever ye do, do it heartily, as unto the Lord and not unto men, knowing that the Lord shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. I tried, tried to train my sons when they went to go to work. Work hard all the time. I don't care if the boss is around or not. You do your job to the fullest ability. You put everything into it. Eric used to get upset with me a few years ago when I first started out there. We had uh, one patch of strawberry. I started at 6 o'clock in the morning. As soon as the sun came up, I could see red. I was out there. There's times I didn't quit until 9 o'clock when it got dark. And he got upset with me because I never stopped to take a snack or, or take a drink. I was out there all that time. I was used to it because I worked in the mill. You work in the mill, it's banner. There was no breaks. There was nobody to relieve you. If you had a bad day, you were stuck there until the time you walked out. Got used to it. Kill me? No, not yet. It, it made down the road here, but it hasn't killed me yet. Always heard that old adage, hard work never kills anybody. Most of the time it don't. We need to put all of our effort in what we do. And when we're doing things for Christ or for God, we need to put all out. We need to put everything we can into it. In 1 Peter, the first chapter, verse 22, seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit into unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. What are we talking about? Everything. You put everything into it. Just like your relationship between a husband and wife, your relationship between your kids and your, you, you as a father or mother, you put everything into that relationship. If you don't, it falls apart. You'll have problems. But if you love one another as you should and put everything into it, You'll have a great relationship. You'll have a loving relationship. 
as we discussed this morning. When we talked about the family relationship, how a husband and wife should treat each other, what did we say about a husband? He should be willing to die for their wife. To do whatever they can to, to get what they need. Now, I'm not saying go out and kill yourself trying to get her a mansion and, and two uh, limos and get what you need. If you need medications, you work for that. You get her medications as much as possible. You try to get her the doctors that will help her get well. You do everything. You, you love her. You put everything into that relationship as you ought. As a wife does with her husband, that should be the same way. If she does and he does get so sick and, and, and are full of cancer, you should be there by their side. You should be trying to nurse them back to health. Put everything into that relationship. We as Christians need to put our relationship to one another to the fullest. We should care about one another. We should be there in time of their need, time of their loss. We need to sit back and talk to them or, or help them in any way we can. As God loved for us and died for us, we should be willing to do such for each other. Now, all these coaches will tell their players, you, go out, you give it your all. You do your best. You put 110% in this play, we'll win. But what happens when a team don't put 110%? And sometimes you can tell if they're not putting everything into it. Just by their reaction. Had a low league team. We we played one year in a scrimmage game from Winterville. And we were getting beat thirty to two. So I pulled the kids together and said, Let's have fun. Okay. What do you, what, what you want to do? Well, we're gonna make a comeback. Well, I'm gonna bunt everybody. Everybody bunt. Until I tell you to quit. Well, the first kid walked up. He bunted. Kid, kid threw the ball all over the place. He over on third base. Next kid came up. Seven kids in a row bunted. That ball, I've never seen that ball all over the field, <laughs> on, on a baseball field in my life, as they were just all shook up. By the time the inning ended, we were down 30 to 20. And they were took them to death that they were able to, to do such. I ran out too many innings. <laughs> I didn't have enough. But you know them kids, they, they felt better about themselves. They gave 110% trying to do what I asked them to do. And it worked. The coach walked up to me and he says, nobody in their right mind butts seven kids in a row. I said, well, I was going to go for nine and maybe more. But I decided to call it off. I said, when we get in these playoffs, watch out, because I may do that. We beat them every game we ever played in different tournaments. And he got really upset about it. But my, those kids that I had at that time put everything into that game knowing that they could beat this team. We, likewise, if we put 110% in doing God's will, we know that we can overcome anything this congregation can face. It has. It happens. It works. Just like that football team, when they all put 110% out, they win. Think about it. 
These are some of the things that we can learn through football, and we need to apply them to the church and to ourselves. I plead with you to sit back and think about what we talked about this evening and question ourselves. Are we executing the plan that God has set forth for us? Are each one of us doing our responsibility and trying to get the congregation to grow, the church to grow, that God wants it to grow? Are we giving 110%? Or are we just like those sometimes in the mill? It's just, well, God's not watching, so I'll just, I'll just blow a gag around, not put everything into it. Or do we put everything into it? Do we do everything 110%? Think about it. Because it can cost us our soul just like it can cost them the championship or whatever that they're striving for. Now, you may be, not be a member of the church. You've heard his word. You need to believe that he came and lived and died upon the cross, resurrected the third day. That's the start. You put your faith in that amount at that time. Repent of your sins. Be willing to change your life. Live for God and not for yourself. Dedicating yourself. You're putting 110% in trying to do His will. Confession. So He confessed us before His Father. Baptized by immersion. What rose up? So what, out of a watery grave. It's a new creature. As Christ was different when He came out of the grave. Live a faithful life unto death. But, you know, we do create penalties or mistakes. We do fall. We do mess up. God pleads with you to come back. Repent of those sins. We go to God in prayer and ask for forgiveness of those sins and put you in the right path once again. But it's up to you. I can't make that decision for you. Nobody else can. It's your decision. Heaven or hell. I obey Christ tonight or I could lose my soul. we got no guarantee how long life will be. Believe me. Think about it. Do something about it before it's too late. I have to stand and sing the song. Invitation.